Uh, hello, everybody. Can I have your, uh, can I have your attention to start tonight? So first of all, I want to welcome you to the uh, annual Hendrik de Waard uh, Foundation uh, lecture talk um, that we've organized. We are the foundation here. And together with Studium General, we have organized uh, today's lecture. Uh, on one organizational note, there will be uh, complimentary beverages for you uh, after the talk. And these will be downstairs in the Bruinsaal, which is very near the uh, entrance. But I think uh, we'll also let you know where it is. And then uh, I would like to give the word to uh, Professor Nasser Kalantar. And he is going to uh, say a few introductory words about uh, our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Robert. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here in this uh, great hall of the university, which was supposed to be the great hall, of course, but it was occupied by another group. So unfortunately, we came to this hall, which is still a great hall. Everybody hears me in the back? Yes? OK, good. So tonight, uh, we have this lecture, famous lecture, Henry Devard Lectures, which uh, is organized every year by the foundation. And I don't know if everybody knows uh, Henrik de Waard. I didn't think that I have to do it, but okay, I know Henrik quite well uh, from uh, 30 years ago when I moved to Groningen, of course, one of the good physicists that I met. Uh, in fact, in two weeks' time, he would have been 100 years old. 20th of April, 1922, he was born. So uh, had he lived, he would have been over two weeks, 100 years old. He was a theoretical physicist who uh, basically studied in this city. Of course, he moved around. He went to uh, other places uh, within Europe, the United States, but always came back home to his base, which was Groningen. And he stayed here for uh, his own life, for physics, of course. And, uh, theoretical physics, he started with atomic physics. He did uh, <coughs> nuclear physics. Uh, he did quantum uh, uh, phenomena. He did many, many things in physics, so he's internationally actually known as a theoretical physicist. Nobody actually calls him a nuclear physicist or atomic physicist. He knew everything. So uh, in his honor, of course, uh, the foundation was made. Uh, and the foundation organizes these lectures. And I have the honor to introduce the speaker of uh, this evening, Professor oh, sorry. Professor uh, Christian de Moraes Smith, uh, originally from Brazil, uh, where she actually did her uh, work, PhD, at the uh, University of Campinas, uh, after which uh, she also moved around, uh, like we all do as uh, scientists. Uh, she was in Su uh, Switzerland. Uh, then she moved back, I guess, to Campinas to finish her studies and came back again to Europe. Eventually, uh, she joined the Faculty uh, of uh, Science at the uh, University of Utrecht since 2004. So she has been in this country now for 17 years, entering the 18th year, right? We were speaking uh, actually in English, so we decided also that this meeting will be done in English, as it was announced before. And uh, the topic of tonight, of course, uh, you can see the title behind uh, me, the consciousness, can it be explained by quantum physics? So every single word has a meaning, which we hope to uh, discover tonight from your lecture. What is consciousness? What is quantum physics? I hope that we can also learn a few things about quantum physics from you. And then the question, the big question is, can consciousness be actually explained by quantum physics? So with pleasure, I'd uh, like to ask Christina to uh, start the speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Do you hear me well in the back of the room? Yes? If you don't, please start giving me signs, OK? So it is a great pleasure to be here with you tonight. I prepared a lecture which is extremely simple for someone who does not know anything about physics. So I apologize with the physicists if this gets too simple for you. I hope to give you some insight about how to teach quantum physics for people who don't know physics. Maybe that's good, that could be my contribution to the physicists. So when you look at the title, 
there are two things that look very difficult, right? The first one is consciousness. What is consciousness? I don't know. There is no agreement about what it could be. There are many ideas. And I can imagine that many of you might have your own ideas about consciousness is or is not. And I will be very glad to hear. We'll have half an hour for discussions at the end. So you can give uh, some input and we can have subjects for discussion about consciousness. And the other interesting topic here that looks also very difficult is quantum physics. For physicists, we are used to it. Someone said once, we do not really understand quantum physics. We get used to it. Okay? So I will try to give you a feeling about what quantum physics is about. And we are going to do that with the help of art. Art is something easier to understand. It's more visual. So I hope to give you some insight with that. So, there is a very famous Dutch painter, Willem de Koning, and once he said something that I find very interesting. So, he said, every so often, a painter has to destroy painting. Cezanne did it, Picasso did it with the cubism, and then Pollock did it. And by destroying, there could be new paintings again. So revolutions, they have to occur in art as well as in science. And every time when they come, it looks like all our paradigms are being shaken and they are being destroyed. But hopefully they bring us new perspectives. So I am not going back until Cezanne. But I would like to start with Picasso to give you insights about quantum physics. So, quantum mechanics is a theory that was developed in the beginning of the 1900, when there were several experiments that one couldn't understand with classical physics. So, classical physics was the physics that was explaining when the train leaves Utrecht at a certain time, it moves at a certain speed, you can predict at what time I'm arriving in Groningen, as I did today. That is governed by classical laws. But then, if you go to the world of very small particles, like the electrons, you know all the atoms, you have the nucleus, you have the electrons turning around, and if you try to see how these electrons are moving, you can't predict it with the same laws as for the train. You need completely different laws. And those are the laws of quantum mechanics. So one very interesting thing from quantum mechanics is that these tiny particles, they are not only particles, but they are also waves. What does this mean? So in the beginning of the 1900, we had two kinds of theories that they were very different. So one is particles, like billiard balls, right? And the other one are waves. If I throw a stone in the water, in the swimming pool, I will make waves. If I throw two stones in the swimming pool, it's possible that one wave cancels the other. It's the same for sound. It, places which are very noisy, like at an industry, the machines are making noise. You can make another machine that makes a noise where when on top of the one wave is here, the bottom of the other wave is here. And one top plus one bottom cancels and gives me zero. So waves are things that can annihilate each other. You just start with the two of them out of phase. When one goes up, the other goes down, with the same size. But particles are things that cannot annihilate. If I take one billiard ball plus one billiard ball, there is no way I can have zero billiard balls, right? So 
these were two completely different concepts, and we knew, we knew about waves for the electromagnetic waves for light, we know about waves for sound, these are waves propagating in the air, but those are very different things. And suddenly, in quantum mechanics, we learned that everything that was a wave is also a particle. And everything we thought it was a particle, like the electron, that we always imagined it as this little ball that I'm drawing here, it is actually also a wave. So this is called the duality of quantum mechanics. And it was very difficult to understand. How can objects be two completely different things at the same time? Right? So what's quite nice is that Picasso came at the same time when quantum theory was being developed. If you think of the Dutch masters, they were painting at a time when we did not have photography. So they had to paint reality to immortalize it in a way that we can see it uh, hundreds and hundreds of years later and see how life was at that time. But suddenly, photography is there. We can take a very fair good picture of what is there. So the painters have to do something else, right? That's when then painting started evolving into something else. And Picasso did a fantastic step, because until then, a painter would look at someone and paint it from one perspective. So it's quite arrogant, right? to have one perspective of the painter, as if that object would be only that, right? But suddenly Picasso tells us, no, what the painters are doing is not the object, is one representation of the object, and it's not all. So he integrates in the same painting several faces of the same object to remind us that what I'm seeing is not only the object I'm seeing, it's not only his perspective, there are many others. Okay? So when you look at me, you see my face. You are not seeing my back. So if I am looking at you like this, you see my face. If I turn, you see my back. It's the same in quantum mechanics. You do one experiment, and you see that it is a particle. You do another experiment, you see it's a wave. You see my waves there? I went to the hairdresser for you today. But it was raining. They are all gone, my waves. So, depending on the experiment you do, you see one aspect of the same object. But the entire object is both. But you can't see both at the same time. Either you see my back or you see my front. But Picasso was just superposing all of them to remind you that reality is more complex than one single regard that you have towards it by looking or by doing one type of experiment. Okay? So for me, Picasso is my inspiration to illustrate quantum physics. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about it, there is a short movie on YouTube from an interview that I gave once, it's called Physics a la Picasso. I usually say I do Physics a la Picasso. Also because we try to simplify what we do so much that we can solve our equations analytically in the same way how he simplified with cubism all the shapes and tried to represent each object by minimal elements. Like the woman are two circles and a triangle, this is the minimal representation of a woman. And if you have a cylinder with this, you know it's a woman. That's our models. When we do Hubbard model and whatever, it looks like Picasso painting. Okay. But there is one thing that is even more complex and so interesting in quantum mechanics, which is, suppose you have a particle or a wave which can be in a certain state. Let's think of Schrodinger cat. The Schrodinger cat is alive and dead at the same time. I remember when I was very young and someone told me Schrodinger cat is alive and dead. I was there, what the hell? 
how it can be alive and dead at the same time. That is not comprehensible, right? So that's why I had a different example for you to try to understand how something can be in two states at the same time. Take a coin, throw it in the air. While it is in the air, it is at the same time face and tail. When it falls into my hand, it will be either face or tail. But as long as it is in the air, it is both. It could be one, it could be another, depending on where I put my hand. Okay? So you can think of this like being a quantum state. A quantum state, you can prepare it in a way that it is two things at the same time. And then you make a measurement. I put the hand and the coin collapses into my hand. This is the so-called collapse of the wave function. When it comes to my hand, it will be only one of them. And then it is a classical state. Okay? So in the air, it's quantum. At my hand, it will be classical. It will have collapsed into a possibility. Okay. This is, uh, these are sculptures by a German um, sculptor, uh, Foss Andrei. And he tries to give us some perspective of quantum mechanics. So you have these sculptures that, depending on the angle that you look at them, they are either solid or nearly invisible. Right? So that is another way to try to represent quantum mechanics. Depending on the way how I look at it, I see different things. I find him very inspiring also. How nice it goes from, from solid to ethereal. There is a church, very nice, not far from here, at the border with the Belgian land. Okay, so that was so for quantum mechanics and the different perspectives and the possibility to be in different states at the same time. That was the revolution that Picasso brought us. But Willem de Koning, who was telling us, yes, not only Picasso did a huge revolution by telling us the way of looking at our objects, but also Pollock did. So Pollock was fascinating. The first thing he did is everybody was painting standing. Here is the canvas, and you paint in a vertical canvas. What he does is he changes perspective. He puts it over the soil, over the ground. And he starts dancing on top of it and pouring colors. So he changed the position of the canvas. He made these gigantic paintings by throwing colors here and there and dancing and following his intuition. He did fantastic things. Among the 10 most expensive paintings, two are from him by dancing and pouring colors on top. So what is behind? Why do they appear so beautiful to us? Well, actually, the paintings of Pollock are fractal. And fractal is something that our eyes and our senses perceive as very beautiful. So maybe you have never heard this word. Let me explain to you what this is. So the thing that we are seeing here on the left is a snowflake. So it was snowing three days ago, right? If you take a flake of snow and you look at it very precisely, it will have this shape. And you keep zooming on it and you keep always seeing the same thing. So fractals are, most of the time, self-similar. The big is like the smaller, the smaller, and the smaller. They are always the same. This is a mathematical equation. This is a mathematical fractal, but it has the same type of features. You keep zooming in, and you keep seeing the same. So fractals 
can be very interesting, and I will now draw with you one that's very easy. You can give it as an exercise to your kids or grandkids. When they are disturbing too much, they will be entertained for a while. So you can take a, a black triangle, and now in the middle of it, you draw one inverted triangle, and you cut it out. The white parts are cut out. Okay? You remain with the three smaller ones. In the middle of each one, you draw an inverted triangle and you cut it out. You remain with nine. In the middle of each, you cut an inverted triangle. And you go ad infinitum. Well, a mathematician could go ad infinitum. We are just physicists. We stop somewhere. Right? Okay. So this beautiful triangle where you keep cutting, cutting, cutting is called the Sierpinski Triangle. This is a Polish mathematician who first was drawing that one. Okay? So this is a very typical example of a mathematical fractal. So where do I find fractals? Not only in bipolar mathematicians. We find them everywhere. If you go to the supermarket and you buy Romanesco broccoli, you look carefully, it's a fractal. Each of these ones, if you look inside, it will be like the big picture. If you go now, before spring arrives, walking to the supermarket, you will see that the structure of the trees is fractal. It is always ramifying and getting smaller and smaller, finer and finer. Not only the branches are fractal, the roots are also fractal. And the fractality of the roots, it's extremely important to avoid earthquakes. Not only the branches and the roots, but also the leaves of ferns, for instance, they are fractal. So nature is extremely fractal and because we know nature and we perceive it as beautiful. It's why we like Pollock's painting. But not only nature, our body is extremely fractal. So if you look at our lungs, our circulatory system, our intestines, our neurons, they are all fractal. Even our heartbeat is fractal. Our heartbeat is not periodic and is not chaotic. And if you get ill in the two different directions, you die from it. It has to remain fractal. The fractal is a very subtle equilibrium between order and disorder. It's this fractal, if you look here at the heart beating in 300 minutes, 30 minutes, and 3 minutes, doesn't look like precisely the same. These are fractals in a statistical sense. It is different than the fractals like the Sierpinski Triangle, which is a mathematical exact fractal. Okay? So our body is fractal, pretty much. Any time when you have to exchange things, like for the lungs, that you have to exchange uh, CO and oxygen, it, CO2, it's very good to have this uh, uh, structure that is continuing quite long. For science and technology, fractals are extremely important. So one example that you see here, this is a very old telephone, but it has a fractal antenna. So if you build an antenna with a fractal, you will have at the same time long and short length scales. So you can simultaneously send large and short frequencies. You get all the length scales in it. If you are building solar cells and you cover your surface by a fractal, more you increase the complexity of your fractal, more energy you can store for the same square of uh, 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 support where you are building your solar cell. So fractals are also very important for technology. And of course, they are very important for art, right? So here, 
You see this beautiful Sierpinski triangle? This is from a church in Rome from the 11th century. Nobody knew the word fractal. No mathematician had yet categorized what this is. But people were already using these beautiful motifs because they are beautiful, right? They are appealing to the eye. Okay? So it's only uh, last century that Mandelbrot came and studied and described fractals, but they were there since long. This one, maybe you know, right? This is Escher. If you go to the Escher Museum in The Hague, you will see many of those beautiful kinds of mandalas. And as you approach the boundaries, the same drawing is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. It's another fractal. And here, you see a painting of Pollock. Can anyone see a fractal here? No, right? No, I cannot either. But there was a, a mathematician, a physicist, not a mathematician, James Taylor, studying the paintings by Pollock, and he could reveal the fractal structure underneath. And th then at a certain point, there were two new paintings that appeared, and someone was claiming, this is an original Pollock. So they asked this physicist, can you please analyze? And he looked at them and said, no, it's wrong, it's not. It's false, it's fake. Because at this period, when they were claiming that the painting was from, the fractal dimension in the paintings of Pollock had a certain dimension and this changed with time. Because our biological uh, uh, clocks are changing with time, probably for this reason. And so the physicists said, no, it's fake. And then they did many other analyses and they concluded that indeed it was wrong. It was not a true Pollock. But what's fascinating, it's there. These fractals are emerging. I don't know how. Somehow he has some intuition from the way how he does the, 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 the consistency of the paintings that he's dripping and how he's dancing around. Because he's not in a very drawing manner as Escher constructing his fractals. Okay. There is something fascinating about fractals. Is that Fractals have a fractional dimension. What does this mean? So, we live in a three-dimensional world, right? But if someone can move only over the carpet, you would say it's a two-dimensional world. Or if you take a wire, you say this is a one-dimensional object, right? So now, so we know Systems at one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions. We even know systems at zero dimensions, like a dot, right? But now we are going in between. So let's try to understand how this fractional dimension of fractals emerge. If mathematics is not your cup of tea, just look at it, but it's okay. It's just one slide, okay? So. The, the dimensionality of an object is going to be given by the log of the number divided by the log of the scaling. Let me explain to you what this means. Suppose I have this white line. I scale it by two. Okay? And then I ask how many of the original ones I can put inside here. The answer is two. So the number is here. This is the scaling, and this is the dimension that I am. Now, suppose that I take a square. I scale my square by two here and here, and I ask you, how many white squares can I put inside the pink one? One, two, three, four. The number is four. My scaling was two. I have a number two here. Here tells me, this yellow two tells me how many times I have to multiply two by itself to get this number here. Okay? So I have to say two times two, two twice two, to get four. Here it's once two to get two. Now, if I take a Sierpinski triangle, it is here. Now I scale it by two here and by two here. And now I count how many of the original ones I have here. I get only three, because I had to cut the center one. 
So log 3 divided by log 2 gives me the 1.58. Okay? So if you don't like mathematics, let me explain you in a different way. I, had, I started from something that was a triangle that was filled, and I started cutting pieces of it. Cutting, 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 cutting. At the end, what I have is no longer opaque. It's not compact anymore. It's not two-dimensional. It is also not like a line, but it meanders so much that it's something between a line and between the plane that I started with. That is this number 158. You can intuitively understand it, right? Even if you don't understand logs. Okay, so fractals have a fractal or fractional Hausdorff dimension. So, I am a quantum physicist and I work with electrons. Electrons are my, I do sociology of electrons. I put many of them and I try to understand how they behave, how they interact and how they behave. Do they change their behavior if there are many of them, if they are very close or so? That's what I do. And we know a lot about electrons. We know how they behave in one dimension, in two dimensions, in three dimensions. But how do they behave in fractal dimensions? And you tell me, what the frac? Well, that is how our research started about fractals. And it started in the context of a physicist that had like 100 years, two years ago, we, we celebrated 100 years of the birth of Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman has left a fantastic legacy in physics. QED, Feynman path integrals, or Feynman diagrams, really nice, nice things. QED, sorry. And one of his legacies took very long to be understood. He gave a talk nearly 60 years ago where he said this very provocative sentence, there is plenty of room at the bottom. And at this talk, he was really a visionary. He was telling us, imagine having all the knowledge of the Britannica Encyclopedia on the head of a needle. At that time, it was impossible to imagine Google, you know? Nowadays, for the youth, you click two buttons. What is a fractal? And you get a uh, hundred answers with all the possible links and movies and everything. At the time, no. When I was young, I wanted to learn something. I didn't even know where to search. All this marvelous knowledge, it was not available. But he was already thinking of it. But the other thing that he was telling us is... If you think of the evolution of humanity, humanity, the eras or the ages of humanity have been named after the materials that they were using. We had the Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Silicon Age. We are going out of the Silicon Age. And we want to enter the Quantum Age with quantum computers. So until now, materials were around us. You go there, you pick up, you go to a mine, or first you pick up stones, or then you pick up metals, and then you pick up silicium, right? You pick materials and you build your technological objects. But now we are coming to a point that we have to create these materials that we want to use. So, to create these materials, we have to take matter in our hands. So the proposal by Feynman is, physicists should not only explain nature, they should create nature. Create materials with the properties that they want, with the functionalities that they want, in a bottom-up approach. So this has created a field that is called quantum simulators. So for the first part of what I'm going to show you, this is something that started in California in 1993 at IBM. And this was the first beautiful experiment. It's called a quantum corral. 
by the group of Don Eigler at Almadena, and Almaden, sorry, in Pasadena. And uh, what he did, I told you that electrons form waves, right? So, as you get a coral in the sea, and the water is going to make waves, here, what you are seeing are the electron waves. The separation between each of these bumps here, these are iron atoms that he could arrange in a circle, one by one. This circle, the separation between one red spike here and the next one, is one nanometer. It's zero comma zero 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 eight zeros and one number one of the meter. It's damned tiny, okay? Very, very small. So he could pattern a surface of a metal where there are lots of electrons. We say an electron C, an electron liquid, and then he patterns this, and then the electrons are getting interference and forming waves, and you can see their waves. That was the first quantum corral. But it took a long while, since 1993 until 2012, when people thought, okay, if I have one corral, I can make two. And then I open the door. And then the electrons can move from one to the other. And if I can make two, I can make three, I can make four, I can make a lattice. And this was then what was made. But before I show you the lattice, my move is not working, this one. But I invite you, you could go to, to Google, to YouTube, and you say, a boy and his atom. This is the smallest movie ever made. It's a cute movie. Each pixel that you are seeing here is one atom. Okay? And they have been patterning the entire movie and making all the scenes. They got many prizes. This is IBM making publicity for the work of Don Eigler, a boy and his atom. But here you see what the student, so Hadi Manohadan, he is the head of the group. He was a student of Don Eigler at the time. And what he did nearly 20 years later, he started taking these black spots that you are seeing here. These are carbon monoxide. He had copper, the surface of copper, full of electrons. And this carbon monoxide are little mountains. So he puts many of them, he adsorbates many of those. And then with the tip of the STM, which is a very tiny needle, he pushes them to the position that he wants. And the positions that he's putting them, each of these brown, again separated by one nanometer, they are forming a triangular lattice. And then the electrons have to go around. And then the electrons are forming a honeycomb. This is the lattice of graphene, this thinnest object that has been discovered, this thinnest surface, two-dimensional material. And here he is building one artificial one, which is 10 times larger than the one that we have given by nature. But he can build it 10 times larger with perfection, not a single mistake. And if there is one defect, he can see and he can correct. So you can build perfect matter. Right? So that's how the field was when we entered. And at the University of Utrecht, so I am a theoretician. I'm just doing calculations, design. And then I give the design to my colleagues, experimentalists. So I was telling them, I told you, we know how electrons behave in one, zero, one, two, three dimensions. How do they behave in fractal dimensions? If I build a fractal of electrons, do they understand? How? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Lift your hands. Yes, this helps. Please, no problem. Just cough in peace. <laughs> Very good. So, the question we had is, if we put electrons in a fractal geometry, do the electrons know that they live in fractional space? 
That was the experiment. And here what you can see is an experimental figure of it. This, what you are seeing in white and yellow, are the modulus of the wave function squared. It's the local density of states for the specialists. So these are the, the waves representing the electrons, okay? The amplitude square of the waves representing the electrons. And then you can do a calculation here and you can prove that these waves are living in fractal dimension. So the electron waves can perceive this fractal space. That is the first creation of a quantum corral in the world. And uh, this work was published in 2019, and we were very proud because in 2020, Nature Physics was celebrating 15 years, and they selected the 15 most important papers that they thought and they picked up ours for the celebration in 2020. So we were very happy about that. So we created the first quantum fractals for electrons. Good. But here, everything is static. Then, oops, what is this? Oh, let me go back one. Then, I wanted to understand dynamics, how a quantum particle moves in a fractal. So I had an associate, a, a visiting professor position. Uh, I was a fellow at the, the uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, the TD Lee Institute. And end of uh, 2019, I went visiting them. And then the group of uh, Professor Shen Mingjin and the student who was doing the experiments was Xiao Yun Shu. They were studying fractals. So what did they do? They were building with a laser on a chip these structures. Each of these rose pipes you are seeing here is a waveguide. So they built many of them in a way that the cross-section is a Sierpinski triangle. And his, they are going to build hundreds, thousands of them. Each bunch of them with a different length, short, longer, 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 longer. Okay? And then they are going to put light here at the top. Light is going to propagate along the waveguide, and when it comes to the end of the waveguide, that's why they need to have different lengths, they detect it. This is time, if you want, because there it propagates with the speed of light. You divide the length by C and you get time. But at the same time, this photon is a quantum object, so it can do quantum tunneling. It can jump quantum mechanically from this waveguide to this waveguide or to this one. So it also spreads transversely. Okay? And now, I can show you the experiment. This is the real experiment. Light was injected here, and it's traveling. And out of this experiment, you can measure something that in physics is called mean square displacement. And you can find out what is the physical law that is governing this mean square displacement. So it starts in a way that doesn't distinguish it from a compact object. And suddenly, when it reaches here, the first hole, it changes. And it acquires an exponent which is precisely the fractal dimension. So this is different from how a classical object would move in a fractal. So De Gênes, this was a French physicist, was studying how classical particles move in a fractal. And he said, this is the problem of an ant in a labyrinth. How can an ant move in this kind of labyrinth? But now I have a quantum ant, because it's a photon, it's light. And it will move by quantum tunneling. It's not moving across the path. It hops from here to there. This line here means nothing. It's just to indicate the connection for you to visualize the triangle. I only have these tubes here. Okay? So we could review how is the physical law of this object. Here you can see how it would, these are numerical simulations, how they would go in a compact triangle and how they go into the Sierpinski triangle. And they enter the fractal regime precisely when they find the first, well, when they find the first hole, 
they are lost. They change exponent, and when they go around that they can continue again, they pick up the fractal dimension. It's extremely smart how the photons can know immediately the fractal dimension. So these experiments, we could detect that the mean square displacement is going with time to the Hausdorff dimension. But you say, okay, 158, that's the dimension I had before, maybe it's a coincidence. Let's get another fractal. So this is the so-called Sierpinski carpet. Now you take a square, you take nine squares here, and you cut the middle one. Now it's, you get, you are scaling by three from this one to the others, and you get log eight over log three, which is 189. It has a different dimension. So then you keep cutting and cutting every time, and now you do again the experiment in the Sierpinski carpet, because now this one has dimension 1.89. It's no longer 158. And you see precisely, when light meets here, the first hole, it gets slightly lost and then goes around. When it went around and understood the hole, it picks up the dimension 1.89. Precisely, it's very beautiful to watch. So, yes, we have understood how a quantum particle moves in a fractal. We have the laws for that. Now we come to consciousness. What can this have anything to do with consciousness? Well, many years ago, more than 20 years ago, Roger Penrose, who won the Nobel Prize last year for the discovery and understanding of black holes, together with an anesthesiologist, Stuart Hameroff, he had a proposal a very interesting proposal. He said, look, the neurons in our brain are fractal. So he thought consciousness should be a quantum process. You remember the coin that while it's in the air, it's two things at the same time? It's face and tail? So, so would be our mind. While the information is propagating, there are many things. It's not yet clear what you are thinking. There could be many different things. But this is highly unstable. It's a quantum process. So very fast, this will collapse. Your coin will fall down. And then it's either face or tail. And at the moment when our many superposition of many different things in our brain collapses, we are conscious. It's the moment of consciousness. So this is what Roger Penrose said together with Hameroff very long ago. You can imagine that many people found, oh, what a brilliant idea, but others said, nonsense. How can you have quantum processes in the brain if the brain is operating at room temperature? To measure these things that I was showing you, we go to far Kelvin. It's we are at minus 270 degrees Celsius. How can we suddenly have something quantum at plus 300 Kelvin, right? So 27 degrees Celsius. How could this be? Well, at the time, I understand that everybody was doubting on it. But now, look at it. We discovered graphene for the physicists in the room. You remember when von Klitzing measured the quantum Hall effect in 1980 and got the Nobel Prize in 1985 for that? To see those plateaus, he needed to go to one Kelvin. Now, you take graphene, you go to this high magnetic field lab in Nijmegen, and you measure the same plateaus at 300 Kelvin. And this is carbon, like our body. And you tell me, come on. Don't give me nonsense. You need a 29 Tesla magnetic field to do that. Otherwise, you can't see it. And you don't have a 29 Tesla magnetic field in your brain. True. It's true. But after the quantum Hall effect, we had the quantum spin Hall effect, which now does not need magnetic fields, no, only spin orbit coupling. And you tell me, forget. Carbon is very light, has no spin orbit coupling. But carbon nanotubes are curved. 
And when you curve space, you get pseudomagnetic fields of 400 Tesla. These are the nanobubbles that have been measured. And if you curve, you are increasing your spin-orbit coupling. So if you talk to me now, from my generation, and you ask me, do you find really absurd that you could have quantum effects in your brain? I find it extremely plausible. I don't find it impossible at all. And we don't know, nobody yet has evoked the importance of topology for the brain, but it could very well be that topology is very important. In any case, people have been fighting like crazy for very long. Is there a process in these neurons quantum or not? What I say is, I don't need to fight. Look, what did we do? We artificially created a quantum fractal, and we have seen how a quantum particle is moving through the quantum fractal. We measured the laws that are governing this behavior. So now, go back to the brain and measure the, the neurons. If the law is the same as ours, it is quantum. We don't need to argue. So by creating a quantum simulator in a fractal, we know the laws. How is quantum mo motion in a fractal? And then maybe we can give some contribution to this problem that has been making so many people enthusiastic. Okay, I am coming to the end of my talk, but just before I finish, I would like to show you something. So, Albert Einstein said once, when he was talking about quantum mechanics and the fact that we are throwing the, the coins and it could be this or it could be that, right? He was very disturbed by it. And he said, God does not play dice with the universe. I am not even sure. Let me show you something very interesting. So, this is a game. It's called the Chaos Game. And you can also find it on YouTube if you want. Let me just stop it to explain you what is the rule of the game. So we are going to draw a triangle. And now I choose one point. You could even choose outside the triangle, but let's choose inside any point to be simpler. Now I say this is number one, number two, number three. But I don't know any dice with three numbers. My dice have six numbers, right? So let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. And now I play dice. Every time I get number one or number four, I bring this, I will connect this point to this vertex because this is one and four. And I pick up the middle point. And then I play dice again. Suppose I get number two. I will take this point and connect it to this vertex. This is vertex two and five. And I pick up the middle point. Okay? And then you keep playing dice for long. So let me play dice. Oops. I have to go further and now I can let it play for you. Choose a random point, play dice. Got number two. You choose and you choose a middle point between the two. Now, play dice. Number one. You connect and you choose the middle point. Number two again. Keep playing. Two thousand iterations, and you get a fractal out of total chaos. Isn't it amazing? So you play dice, and by playing dice, you get a fractal, and our body is fractal, and nature is fractal. So maybe God is playing dice with the universe. So with this, I would like to conclude by telling you. Indeed, as Feynman was saying, there is plenty of room at the bottom, but 
even more in a fractal. And I would like to let you with the image of my collaborators, some of them, so for the fractal don in Utrecht, Ingmar Zwart, he's the experimentalist at, at the STM lab, and the main student who was doing the experiments was Mar Louis Lott, and Sander Kempkes was my student who did all the calculations before giving them to the experimentalists. For the second experiment with the dynamics in the fractals, Xiao Yunshu was the student doing the, the experiments in the group of Xian Mingjin. And the others also did lots of things that I'm not going to tell you about. The group is bigger, but those are some who are connected to fractals. And I would like to stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this very nice overview of what, how, how our brains could actually work. There is a lot to do still from what we understand. Maybe a short Wait pause. a little bit, yes. So let me, okay, let me just uh, say, uh, based on what you presented to us, and I wanted to leave this to the end, of course she has received many prizes as you can imagine, but she received in 2019 the European Physical Society Award called Emmy Noether, or Noether, Noether, I think, Award. This is a very prestigious prize for her outstanding contributions to the theory of condensed matter systems and ultra-cold atoms to unveil novel quantum states of matter. So this I left to the end because I, now you understand what every word means when she talks about very cold atoms, when she talks about low dimensionality and all these things. And she is an expert, real expert around the world for this sort of matter, let's say. Low dimensionality is dimension 1, 1 1.5, 1.8, and all these things. So, Fantastic work, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, more experiments on how consciousness can be interpreted by quantum dynamics. Thank you again. Thank you. With this, I'd like to uh, give the word to you first. Many people would like to ask questions. Yes, yes, of course. I thought, yes? Okay, very good. So uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions and comments. We have half an hour before we go down for the drinks. So I'd like to ask the audience to keep the questions also very brief. And if there are comments also, please keep the comments short so that there is time to react to the comments as well by the speaker. So please. Uh, there's a thing. Uh, there is one here, one I can there, do. one there. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I was wondering, you had a Sierpinski fractal yes. appearing in, uh, appearing in Can Are there more of these fractals that suddenly pop up? Because there's only one that was... Uh, uh, oh, from the random rule. Yeah, mean. yeah. So, uh, no, there is not just one. If you would start with the square, you would fill up the entire square. Except if you put on additional constraint, that you never repeat the same vertex twice. If you do the, the, the random rule, and you say, okay, if I get the same vertex twice in a row, I don't take. And then I play again. Mm -hmm. And then you get a Sierpinski carpet. Uh -huh. okay. So the rule for the square and the triangle, but you can get many of them. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, one over there. Yeah, so you're saying that the brain may, um, uh, work through quantum physics, um, but then there should be some kind of periodic structure, right? Just like in the nanotubes. Ah. Has there been any research about uh, periodicity in the, in the brain? Okay, so uh, the way how the brain might be working uh, in terms of quantum physics, so the, the brain is fractal in two manners. The structure of the neurons is fractal. It has been measured last year the fractal dimension of the neuronal structure was measured. I think it's 146. It depends on if you start from 146, 145. It's around there. Uh, 
But there is something else that is also fractal, and this is very interesting. It's a recent experiment they did. So they take lots of people, and they measure their brain with RMN, with magnetic resonance. And with the magnetic resonance, they can know which parts of the brain are being activated and which parts correspond to what, right? So they read a text to lots of people with different backgrounds, different levels of education and so on, while measuring their brain activity. So when they read the, 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 the text to them, they notice the first part that is activated in the brain is the part connected to talking. The second one is the part connected to hearing. The third one is the part connected to vision. And the fourth one is the part connected to understanding. And the way how these parts get illuminated forms a fractal. Then, what was very interesting, they started scrambling the information. They read the same text, but they take a middle paragraph and they put it at the end. So what they see is that the fractal formation is unprecise. It stops in the middle. It goes to the mouth and to the ears, but it doesn't come to the eyes. And then they scrambled in a different way. They take the order of the sentences is the same, but they mix the words in a sentence. The same. The fractal formation doesn't go to the depth until it can reach the understanding part. So there are fractals being formed at the different levels, morphological and dynamical, in terms of how information is propagating. So now it comes, if you are able to measure how information is propagating through these fractals, and then you have to measure mean square displacement, that's what we could detect, does it obey classical or quantum laws? That could be a way to answer whether quantum mechanics has a role on it or not. Questions? Uh, could you please take it up? <laughs> Anyways, I have uh, two questions. So first one, recently I read an article that in uh, certain Chinese research managed to uh, perform quantum experimentation in temperatures, which was a breakthrough because, as you mentioned, quantum computing requires extremely low uh, temperatures for the superposition to happen. Uh, can, I'm not sure if you know that research. That yes, I know. I know him but too. But can it explain yeah. the quantum phenomena that might occur in yeah. the brain? There is lots of quantum phenomena being measured nowadays at room temperature. One of them is what I said by the group of André Geim in Nijmegen, measuring the quantum hole effect at 300 Kelvin. And this group, uh, he is also in Shanghai, and he measured recently. He is involved in quantum information, and he is measuring things at room temperature. It's right. That, that's one of the holy grails nowadays to, to do. We want to build a quantum computer. Because a quantum computer, instead of, a, you see, the, maybe I, I explain a, a bit further for the public to understand what the issues are. We had before metals like copper, a current is passing. Insulators like glass or plastic, no current. And then we had semiconductors like silicium. You can have a current or not, because there is, it is, uh, a bit like an insulator, but not with a big gap, a little gap. So in silicon, you can have a current passing, this is a one, or no current passing, this is a zero. These are the bits of the computer. Now you want to build qubits. And these qubits are not going to be zero or one, but they are going to be a superposition, a bit of zero, a bit of one, at the same time. Like the coin that is in the air. Because then you can have very secure transfer of information and you can calculate things that you cannot with usual computers. And you want to do this at room temperature. So you should be able to get quantum process operating at room temperature. That's the entire issue about getting quantum process at room temperature. But maybe the brain is one of the answers. Yes. Uh, and another quick one is... Uh I, I didn't really think about it before, but in psychedelic research, especially in LSD, 
brain gets inhibited. And a common characteristic is that the world is perceived through fractals. Uh -huh. And uh, in neurology, the eyes, they originate through the same mechanism as the brain. So the perception of the world through the eyes can be seen also as the brain reacting to it. Uh -huh. How can you comment on the fact that the brain, when it's inhibited and on psychedelics, sees fractals around? And yeah, that, that's a very interesting. There was also, not only with psychedelics, there was a case of someone who had a bike accident and has beaten the brain, and everything what he would see were fractals <laughs> until the brain recovered, and then he was seeing something else than fractals. There are lots of studies along these directions. There are, for instance, studies that uh, when people are in hospitals, if you put them looking at a cement wall, or if you put them looking at trees and nature, which is fractal, they recover much faster by looking at the, what is green, and they need less painkillers. And this is because the region that perceives the beauty of the fractals is very close to the endomorphin. And as you are seeing fractals, your endomorphin gets activated, and then you need less painkillers. So if you have pain, go and look at nature. That's what they say, it should help you. So, yes, it's not understood, but it is there Thank to you. be further. There is a question in the there back is a question there, in the back. a lady, very before, yeah. By the way, this was what the Indians would do, right? Before the, the <laughs> technology was known, they would go to nature and get cured. There was a question that... Back there, right? I, no. No? I saw a hand and um, I, I don't see it anymore. There. You can also shout, right? Yeah, he Maybe in the middle here, good catch. I have, a, yeah. I have a short question, maybe not a simple one. More loudly, please. More close, more loudly. It's uh, about the quantum uh, tunneling. Yeah. Um, what, so basically my question is, what are the laws governing that? Why is it? Skipping spaces. Yeah, so quantum tunneling. How the photon was going from one waveguide to the other, right? So it's the following. So quantum particles are ghosts. They can go across the wall. Why? Because they are a wave. So a wave is something... I even brought something to write because I thought maybe I get a board. Look. <laughs> ah, you are well equipped. I have many. This is now a quantum particle. It's not like a ball fully concentrated, but it's a wave. So you have a quantum particle, and you would represent that it's here. And then there is another one, which is here. So you see that there is an overlap between the tail of one and the tail of the other. And this overlap gives me the quantum tunneling. So basically, most of the particle would be here on this side of the wall, but there is a tail that it's on the other side. So there is a finite probability, because this is describing probabilities. There is a finite probability that this particle goes there, and this overlap between these two is giving me the tunneling. Can you understand something like this? So you won't have the uh, same result every single time. Sorry? Say it loud. So you won't have the same result every single time. You don't have the same? Same result every single test because of the... Ah! That is... Yeah, yes. so you do you, when okay. you are measuring... You are measuring lots of times, and so you do for several different length scales, and lots of times, and you are averaging. Yes. Yes, quantum process, you always do many times, and you are averaging. Yes. Our probabilities, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. Yes, here uh, there's a question you can throw. Well, very good, very good. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I had a question. So Roger Penrose also worked on what are uh, Penrose tilings, which is how you can tile the plane non-periodically with only two tiles. 
uh, what are the connections between them and fractals? Because fractals are very periodic. You have the same shape repeated, while spiral styles are kind of the opposite because they are non-periodic. Uh, what are the connections between the two? And can what we find what? I, I didn't hear well what you said. That are aperiodic. Uh, yeah. So spiral styles are non-periodic. You can tell. Ah, the tiles. Yes. Oh, yes. Quasi crystals. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. What What's the connection between the tiles and yes. uh, the fractals? Yes. And can we see something like this in the brain? Yes. Because I know about quasi crystals. Yes. Yes. Thanks. This is a very good question. So maybe some of you have heard about quasi crystals. So this is something that's not periodic but seems to have some order. They are beautiful, like the fractals, but they are not the fractals. Actually, it was a, a, a Dutch physicist who described them. If you start in higher dimensions, in four dimensions with a periodic structure, and you project into three dimensions, you will get something which is not periodic, but it keeps the order of the fourth dimension. So, Quasi-crystals are these beautiful structures with, for instance, 10-fold symmetry or 5-fold symmetry, which do not exist in reality. They are all artificial. There is just one that was found in Russia and came with a meteor, which is a, a, a crystal, that, a quasi-crystal that was found in nature. The others are uh, not. They are all artificial. But uh, quasi-crystals, actually, if you take the simplest one, which is, for instance, the Fibonacci chain. Let me draw for you what is the Fibonacci chain. I will not be able to draw it very well because I am an awful drawer. But suppose you start in two dimensions with a structure like this, and now you draw a line Oh, I'm drawing really wrong, with a slope that is the inverse of the Fibonacci number. Okay? And now, because I have been drawing so horribly, what you will do is that each vertex which is nearby, you project here. And so on. You should, because it is an incommensurate slope, you would never cross any other vertex. My, my drawing is very bad. But then you would get a, a, a sequence of points which come according to the Fibonacci rule. The Fibonacci rule is the following. It's about rabbits. There are small rabbits, and after the next generation, they become large. And each large rabbit in the next generation makes a baby. Okay? So you start with a small Next generation, it is large. Next generation, the large makes a baby. Now, the next generation, the large makes a baby. And the S became large. Next generation, the, la the large made a baby. The S became large, and the large made a baby. And you go on. Large make a baby. S becomes large. Large make a baby. Large makes a baby, and S becomes large. And every time you see, you have one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, etc. This will follow a Fibonacci sequence. So you can make this line here is going to be a line such that you get large, small, large, large, small, large, small, large. For instance, just by measuring distances in two different distances. When you look at this, you would say, this is disordered. Actually, it's not. It is a quasi-crystal. It's the simplest quasi-crystal. But it knows about the order for the higher dimension that it had in two dimensions when I draw this line. And what turns out is that the energy spectrum of the Fibonacci chain so this is the Fibonacci chain. The energy spectrum is fractal. So if you now plot, you calculate the energy eigenvalues, you, you do a tight binding model. Are you a physicist? No. OK. So you do a model where particles can hop in this chain by quantum tunneling. And then you calculate which energies can they have. OK? Then you plot 
the waves associated to each energy, modulus square. And you will form a very beautiful fractal. So, in principle, fractals and quasi-crystals are completely different concepts. Okay? But actually, it turns out that quasi-crystals have fractals in Hilbert space, for the ones who are physicists in the room. The energy or the eigenvalue structure is going to be a fractal. So it's connected. Questions in the back, just before behind you. That was an easy one. I challenge the next question to be from very back. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I saw some nice things. Um, I have one question. I'm a bit skeptical about the quantum idea underlying consciousness. About the? Quantum, uh, well, other than chemistry, which is also quantum. Yes, yes. Um, I'm skeptical by the idea of quantum, of conscious being quantum. Uh -huh. um, but I was wondering... You are um, not the only one. <laughs> no, I'm not alone. Um, I was wondering, you were saying there was this experiment, or maybe you can probe uh, the, the, the fractional behavior. Uh -huh. um, but it's known in neuroscience uh, that there's a lot of self-organized criticality, yes. which also gives rise to fractional uh, powers. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I was wondering how you think you can distinguish between the two. Well, they have to measure the, the fractal behavior of the neuronal structure, what has been measured, I think, in September last year. And then you have to measure how it propagates and see whether this is the, the, the number that is appearing in the mean square displacement. I, I don't know. Actually, I am just a quantum theoretician, you see, with a lot of imagination. Yeah, yeah, no. So how they measure in the brain, I have no idea. How they can measure that. I, I am just saying, okay, we did a quantum simulator. We built it. We know how it should be if it's quantum. Now how they can precisely measure, I can't help. Yes, yes, on this side of the room. Can you do that? That's a challenge. Yes, let's see. Oh, no. <laughs> very good, very good. So, please keep it close Hello. to your mouth and okay. speak loudly. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, okay, uh, maybe less of a physical question. I don't know, more philosophical maybe. I was just wondering if uh, you find definite proof. Will we know, what will we know um, about what consciousness is? What will we, will we know the answer to what is consciousness? Ah, what, when we will know. Well, this is, I think, the, the, the problem for this century, right? Understanding consciousness, and it will require an enormous effort of uh, physicists, chemists, neuroscientists, medical doctors, anesthesiologists. It's a damned difficult philosophers, li people studying literature. I mean, there, was, uh, there is lots of discussions. I gave an interview in this site called uh, The Conversation, and then people were writing comments to it, and it's fantastic to see, because it's people from all different areas coming with their own perspective to it. From there, you already see it's such a difficult topic. There are so many different views on it. I don't know much. I can give my grain of salt for it, yeah, I was wondering, you must have thought about it. I'm sure you have thought about it. Yeah, so I, I, I tried a lot, I, I believe, because you see, this feeling that you are in this vague state of mind, right? Where you, before you really get conscious of something, because we do lots of things just in an automatic manner. You close the door of your car and you go back, have I closed or not? You were in the, in the automatic pilot, right? And we think so many things at the same time. And this state of mind is so similar to what would be a quantum superposition of different things that could be this possibility or that. And we know the consciousness as being one. So from what you imagine quantum physics for the collapse of this wave function looks pretty much alike, but it's just my intuition. I mean, this is not a, 
a scientific uh, thing that I can tell you as a scientist, right? I can tell you my intuition. And that's why I started working on it, because I find it very interesting. It may be there are more answers that we can bring. Now we are studying disorder in these structures. How resilient the laws are when you introduce disorder. Where does this go? Can topology play a role in fractals or not? So we are trying to answer other questions that are relevant for physicists to get a more educated answer to your question. For the moment, I can just, just give my intuition from my belly. Maybe I interject a different question just related to this. Before we know how the brain works on more physical processes, I don't know whether memory belongs to a physical process yeah. or is conscious, but suppose we define that to be a physical process. Yeah. If you do not understand how the brain actually treats the memory, yeah. would it be even possible to think about how consciousness might work? Ah. Because I put it under a different category, uh -huh. basically. And yeah, so which role one, memory, one is more physical than the other. Which role one. memory can be playing in the way how the, the, the brain works. Right. Yeah. He's just bringing another piece of complication. <laughs> okay, maybe you go to the next question. That's already <laughs> horrible. That's not Picasso painting. <laughs> we, put, we leave that question for the drinks. Uh, maybe yeah, another maybe question. after a wine I can get a, a question. answer. Yes, okay. Uh, beside the question of what consciousness is, what are your thoughts about the function, the possible function of consciousness? Oh. Hmm. It should be to build a better world, but it doesn't look like. <laughs> that would be the, the good answer, right? Hmm. I don't know. Brings me Isaac Asimov. He, uh, Me, oh, robot. You have a question? Uh, yes. Well, if consci consciousness is a quantum phenomenon, wouldn't you um, notice differences when you are in an um, MRI machine, for example, or in strong magne uh, magnetic fields? Or ah, because you think that this would affect it? Yes, maybe. Ah, interesting question. Because when you are in such a machine, you don't notice anything. Yeah, that is a quite interesting thing. Because I remember many, many years ago, they were trying to detect the mind of people who were meditating. And whether they could see any difference in the brain of meditating people and no meditating people. And they couldn't. For many of them, they couldn't. That was, I think, in Stanford or in Berkeley. It was somewhere in California. Except when they got these monks who can go in an extremely deep meditation phase. And then they had some connections in the back of the brain, which is usually not connected. And they had synapses over there. So now, when you were asking the question, I was just wondering, the other ones who were meditating, not deep enough, had, had they been disturbed by the magnetic field when you were measuring? <laughs> I yeah. don't know, very <laughs> difficult. But it's a very good thing to think about how the measurement is going to interfere with the object that's being measured because this is quantum mechanics. When you measure, you destroy the state and afterwards it's no longer what it was, right? So it's a very interesting question. Please, next question. Yes, I will come to you. Next question. Um, I, yeah, um, so after uh, you told that the Pollock painting is also a fractal. I'm starting to doubt the entire theory of uh, the world around us. So I was wondering, like, how, it, how much of the nature, natural world could um, be fractal without us noticing it? Because within paintings, within our, yeah, in our brains, we are so, yeah, it's, it's almost everywhere. Now yeah. you... Yeah. Yeah. Your presentation. So yes. I was wondering if you might think that the entire world is made out of it. <laughs> well, uh, there are lots of fractals. We know the sense of beauty, right? For the phi, the proportion of the phi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we are getting close to the end then. So, the <laughs> so we know the golden rule and how much golden rule brings us a feeling of perfection 
and of beauty, right? You see it in architecture. I once entered a house of someone that had been made by a very famous architect from Portugal who won the, the, the big prize. And I remember that I entered and I felt something of perfection as I had never felt anywhere else. I didn't know that the guy had made this house and he's using all the time this golden rule for each board, for each wall, for everything. I could feel it. And then I said, but, but this house is incredible. And they said, oh yeah, it's from this guy. <laughs> oh, okay. So let's do this when we are renovating our houses also, right? <laughs> but again, goes into a feeling. Next question, yes. Hi. Uh, sorry, yeah. Maybe I'm lacking imagination. I'm not a physicist. But if it turns out that consciousness is a quantum phenomenon, what would be the implications of that? Yeah, so, well, first of all, the, the first implication is that we would have many more possibilities than if it's classical, right? For instance, a quantum particle moves and perceives the entire space at the same time. A classical particle goes from A to B through one very well-defined path. A quantum particle is exploring at the same time the entire space, not only one path. So quantum processes are much, much richer than classical ones. So we would have much more possibilities available if it's quantum. That's why I think it is. We are such a perfect machine. Why should you pick up just one path? I don't think it is. But it's... Yeah. Floris, there is a question down here. Here, here. Thanks for the talk. Um, translating physics into something understandable. Uh, so I have one very short question, which is if fractal, you, you're looking at fractals on a very, 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 very small scale, yes. but do they also apply when you look to larger scale physics, like on the astronomy scale, for example, do they find fractals oh, yes. in the universe on yes. that scale? Yes, yes, there are beautiful works about that. Again, you would go, yeah, at the very small and at the very large, the world gets together again. There is a work by a guy, how is he called? He has been a student of Renate Lowell, and I, I just forgot his name, but if you send me an email, I can find his reference for you, precisely talking about the fractals in the universe. I guess that should so, be a surprise. Yes, yeah, it would go also back there. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, if we're seeing fractals maybe permeating everything in the end when we look close enough, yeah. what's the line or the differentiation between the fractals that you might see in the brain and the fractals you see everywhere else that gives us an experience of being conscious and other things maybe not an experience? So I, I know what it feels like to be human, but does a tree know what it feels like to be a tree because it has fractals? Yeah, and we even don't know whether the tree feels different than us, right? True. Yeah. I don't know. I will meet tomorrow a, a, a guy from Denmark, a filmmaker, a film director, who is precisely thinking about that. When they killed the giraffes and the issues about consciousness and when one animal has the right to kill another one, arguing that they are not conscious, right? What do, do we know whether they are conscious or not? What do we know whether the trees are conscious or not? They transfer food through the underground from one to the other when one is lacking food. So is this not a, a kind of consciousness? They communicate through the underground. What do I know? I'm back to being just a very mere poor physicist. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes, there is a question here in the center middle. So again, I'm not a physicist either, but you said something there that kind of struck me when you were talking about the triangle, and you spoke about how the electrons kind of found their way, um, and you, you said, aren't they so intelligent? And you kind of like ascribed or anthropomorphized the electrons to have some kind of 
intelligent capacity or conscious capacity themselves. So if, let's say, electrons in this state are conscious, would that locate consciousness outside of the body altogether? Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. So, yeah, the way how I talk about electrons as being intelligent, you know, electrons are my pets. I love them. I refuse to call them it. They are my pets. So, when I talk about them, maybe I get very involved emotionally, and I say they are so smart, and now you start thinking electrons have consciousness. I don't know if electrons have consciousness. The only thing I know is, if they start propagating in the beginning, they are seeing a structure as if it would be completely filled. Then you see the image. In the moment when they find the hole, the law changes. Okay? And then you see, because you can take images, let me get back there. Because you can take photos, yeah, like here. You can take photos every time and you know the times because it's also propagating in the transverse direction, right? So what you see is that at this precise moment here, when it meets 2.675, when it met the hole, the first hole, the law changes. And then it starts going around, and at 3.575 it can propagate again. You see that it's red here and here? At that point, it understood that there was a hole there. And at that point, it already knows the fractal dimension, because from this point on, it starts going governed by the fractal dimension. So, looks like pretty smart object, right? Go around, touch a bit. Oh, it's a fractal. It knows. And then you can start putting disorder. So, let me show you the other one. It is easier to put disorder. So, suppose that I take this hole here, and I say, okay, let's make it confused, right? I put this hole slightly below here. So, then it will think that it's going to be a, a, a square where everything is displaced. But then suddenly the light comes and meets this one, which is not in the right place. You see it in the exponent. It gets confused. So it's quite beautiful how much by seeing one, it already understands how the structure would be. But then if it's not, it's like, hmm, something is strange here, right? that you can measure. So, thank you very much for all these uh, answers to all the various questions that have been raised, and I'm sure there are many more. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, the whole night for uh, questions and answers. However, we do have another half an hour downstairs, so if you have urgent questions or burning questions, you may approach the speaker again and then ask the questions. There are two uh, points of order here. I think uh, first, <laughs> The daughter. Okay. Well, this was fascinating. I can't say I understood everything, but it gave me lots of food for thought. I'm the daughter of Hendrik, uh, yes. and my mother has asked me to present you with a small gift Thank on you. her behalf. Thank so this is a gift including the bag, which will remind you of our university. Oh, nice. And it is also something you will see when you open it that is typical for our region, for oh, Honingen. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank very you. nice. And thanks again for a fascinating lecture. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you all. And I would also love to extend a huge thank you from on behalf of my entire family to the team of the Henrik Devat Lazing. Uh, you guys have put something really beautiful together here, and I really, we really appreciate everything that you do uh, here and also for the community in general. You guys are wonderful. So I'd like to uh, give you a little token of our appreciation uh, and say thank you so much for putting this together. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, and now uh, the, the foundation. Oh, you're so 
happy that after such a long time, finally, you were able to hold the lecture, and we thank you very much. And uh, thank you. <laughs> here's oh, a little gift with the uh, Groningen products from the region. Oh, so nice! Thank you very much. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you. Um, and of course, uh, lastly, we want to thank uh, Studium Generale, who has made this all possible, the promotion, everything, uh, the setup. Um, thanks to you, this lecture is possible, so uh, we have a, a little something for you guys as well. Um, especially Nina, who we've had uh, contact with a lot, and uh, we were very happy to work with you. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess, uh, yeah. So we now go for the drinks, and uh, we thank everybody for the presence for this evening. Good night. <laughs>